Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us. Today we have with us Joe, who's the HR Policy Officer at GPSO. We have Hannah and we have Book, who are team leaders at GPSO. But before, first thing I want to do is just to get Hannah to introduce the company, Griffith Post School Options, mm -hmm. and uh, let everyone know what it is that GPSO do. Please, Hannah. Uh, very briefly, we are at GPSO, a day respite facility. Um, we offer programs to individuals with varying capabilities. Excellent. Thank you very much. So uh, just to answer a question first off from Gabriella, she said, what exactly is differently able? Because we use this poster to uh, promote this webinar. And I guess when I started work at GPSO, I found it quite interesting because <clears throat> right from the start, I could tell that they didn't really um, regard people, uh, the, their participants as people with disabilities. They, uh, it was clear to me that they could see them as um, people who were just differently able, have, had different needs, different skills to the rest of us. And at the time I got a poster, that poster there, which is a picture from a car park in Sri Lanka, that rather than saying reserved for disabled, it said di differently able. And that really appealed to me and it was sort of in tune with the way GPSO think and operate. So that's why I said that. Uh, that's why I've used that. And also Jose, Louis, you said, does this topic apply to industrial and service sectors? Uh, yes, it does. The principles and discussion you're going to have, could plot we're going to have, uh, will apply anyway. So as we go, um, I'm going to cross the questions off that you've submitted as they get asked. And these guys have some notes because they know what, roughly what questions they're going to get. So they may look down at their notes from time to time. So the first one, Ramundo, thank you very much for, you, for your question. Joe, Ramundo's asked, how do we address the rapid change that's occurred that I've mentioned in the brief and how do we equip the team accordingly? Yeah, so, the company? yeah for GPSO, we um, restructured. So we had to look at kind of how um, our organisation was being managed and we just had a general manager at the top and then we had a whole bunch of staff and then participants. So I think COVID kind of sparked us to reflect on that. And we implemented um, initially three team leaders, which to are here today, and they manage a small team of disability support workers and participants. Um, so this helped us to give um, direction to staff as well. They had a point of contact um, instead of going directly to the general manager. Um, so yeah, this helped us to manage change when COVID at yeah. the time was the biggest. So the, so the general manager, I guess, he was getting all the risk was tending yeah. to get funneled bombarded. to him. Yeah. Yeah, he was getting bombarded, that's yeah. right. So it was, we had a small staff yeah, good. of, you know, maybe 20, so he was able to manage that effectively. Yeah. And then we grew rapidly, and all of a sudden he was trying to manage, you know, his 70 staff. It just wasn't working. No. And from his point no, of view, and from the staff's point of view, and from the participants' point of view. So the next step was to get some a layer of leadership below yes. um, between the between the, the staff and the general manager, so we could start to sort of spread that risk. That yeah. makes sense, mm -hmm. thanks. So the next question then, Brooke, is to you, if that's all right. That's so fine. Nadim has said, how was the, we talked about the uh, mitigating risk and the risk of safety. How was that, how did you improve that as team leaders? How did you manage that? Well, there was, there was two lots of safety risks involved. So it's risk to the participants and risk to the staff. So obviously we underwent training, um, which we did the jibs. Um, yeah, job instruction. Job instructions, yeah. And this blue car that you all remember. And carried with us diligently. Yeah. 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 You all carried, well done. In my pocket. <laughs> right answer, Well done, great answer. Yep, so we did that and we focused all on the jibs. And yeah, the that training. was the first thing we did, wasn't it? Yeah. Because it was deemed that the most risk was that the staff were turning up and they they wanted to do the right thing, but they weren't always clear on what the right thing was. Yeah. So it was necessary for us to have a system to communicate the right thing to them. So that's why we started with job instruction. That's exactly it right. It was going to have the biggest impact on this. Good. So Hannah, mm -hmm. what was one of the JOBs you worked on and delivered? Mm -hmm. What um, was easy and, well, answer that question first. Yeah, yeah. I specifically worked on and delivered um, the disposal of the employment days. Um, what yeah. I like best. Was, yeah. yeah. What was easy about that? What was easy? It was a it was a nice thorough breakdown. Yeah. Um, Do you remember any of the key points? What was it? Was the folding of the 
tabs, wasn't it? Folding of the tabs. Do you remember that? I remember yeah. you going through it, and it was yeah. the key was how they folded the tabs and to yeah. get everyone to fold the tabs the same That's way. That's right, yeah. Sure it there was a few differing of opinions, so it's yeah, right. to get everybody on the There's a bit of debate about what that should be. Yeah, say. a bit of heated debate. But, but why, was that, <laughs> why was that an important debate? Do you remember why the folding of the tabs was critical? How um, it was done? What was the reason then? So that uh, all of the soil sure. can yeah. keep it in kit. Contained. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, the soil it's was very contained. Important, yeah. That's right. It may sound like a, a, a small, silly a small thing. thing, but it's yeah. really quite important. Yeah. yeah, it's not a small thing when you have a blowout. No, yeah. no it's not a small <laughs> thing no. when you have the risk of infection. That's exactly right. right. You've got to keep it contained. That's good. Right. So that was a really good example about in um, Toyota Talent, one of the books I've seen on the bench over there, it says, master the tiniest item of the highest importance to get the greatest result. Mm -hmm. So you had to make sure everyone mastered that tiniest item of folding mm -hmm. the tabs over yeah. because if they didn't and yeah. we had spillage, then there was a high risk of infection within the yeah. place. And all so, that and bagging it up properly and yeah. disposing in the right bin and stuff like that. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So that was what you liked, but mm -hmm. I know, Hannah, that there was things you didn't <laughs> like about J.I. No. So, <laughs> So what were some of the things you didn't like? Um, at times it could be time consuming and finding that time sometimes and delivering um, those JIBs to staff, considering just the ratios that we currently have at the moment, staff to participant, we're always ratioed in. Yeah. So, so it's quite a mindset thing for team leaders, isn't it, to be able to say, Ham it's a balance, isn't it? If I don't find the time, we're going to have risk. Yeah, that's so right. So if I do find the time, we're going to help control the risk. Yeah. But it's something, that is the reality of your, your world, and you two anyway, yeah. the team leader's world, is you're up against that balance all the time. Yeah. So what are the, some of the things you've done that have been able to improve the time management side of things? The, with the gym training. Well, we worked on it on an admin day. Yeah. So it, um, oh, chose, you set aside specific we did, days. Yeah. We spoke to our, our boss and we had a, a Tuesday set apart, which is our administration day normally where we do a lot of our paperwork and stuff. Good. And Harry and I in particular, we prioritised. Um, yeah, time. we would work together and um, whether it was Hannah's team or my team or the other or the other teams, and we would take, um, you know, two staff from here, two staff from there, and every Tuesday we would go and we would follow up. Okay. And um, take a handful of staff, and then I would do a jib in one room, and Hannah would do a jib in okay. another room. Mm. Perfect. Yeah. So by the sound of that, and I know this will be something of interest to people, you were doing, uh, you were the instructor, I was the learner, but did you have other people watching at the same time? Or were you just doing it one-on-one -on -one all the time? We, well, sometimes there was others watching, yeah. but we always did it one-on-one -on -one with every okay. um, with every staff member. They, we went through that whole process okay. every time. That's what Hannah was probably talking about in time in it being challenging it's a lengthy process yeah, yeah. Mm. um so even though there might have been others in a room it's really hard for i suppose the other staff and remaining staff not to be watching yeah. but they might be watching sort of a little bit and then still carrying on with what they're doing Good. so we would take them one at a time essentially to do that because i remember turning up one day hannah and you were in the room near the pool table there mm -hmm. and you were delivering a jib but there's a number of people watching you mm -hmm. but you were doing it with one learner it was you and the learner yes. you were focused on the learner not the others around the the others. Yeah. yeah so the main thing is the time isn't it and yeah. it is a, it is an, those watching i'm sure will agree it is an issue that confronts everyone mm -hmm. and it's a um it just it, it becomes a priority thing yeah well done so, Joe, I think the next question was to, to you, and it's from Gwen Shard. And Gwen Shard says, how do you develop, how did you develop the learning experiences and content and how do you keep fresh over time? So tell us a little bit about that and the Elmo system that I know you guys have used. Yes. Um, so firstly, to develop the content, we initially had a discussion with the team leaders and again, prioritise um, what theory we would focus on first. Um, so at the time it was infection control with what was happening in the world. Um, so we used a mind map and we kind of brainstormed and had a discussion to develop a knowledge block, which we uploaded to our online um, learning system called Elmo. So do you, do you remember any, what was one of the knowledge blocks you did? Can you remember? Um, well, you did a knowledge block on J.I., didn't you? Yes, we did, to firstly introduce it to our staff. Yeah, you actually did a video on yeah, J.I. Do you yeah. remember why, why did you do that? To assist um, 
staff to be aware of the change that was coming with training. We Brilliant. changed our whole approach to training. Mm -hmm. Change. Yeah. Yeah, so it was one of the products of doing job relations. And I remember on the job relations card, it says tell people in advance yes. about changes. Yeah. So you included it as part of your induction. Yes. So that the staff on being on board would know this is the way they're going to be trained. Someone's going to turn up with a blue card and a JRB. And... Mm. Yeah. We actually also um, videoed ourselves um, doing a gym. Yeah, that's right. Um, so they could actually see it in, have a visual. in real time. Yeah, you have a visual. Yeah, yeah good. And prepare them and how it, you know, yeah. it was um, broken down. Yes, yeah, right. Um, so tell us a bit more, this person may want to know a bit more about Elmo, how did you use Elmo, which is a software system for yes. track and train. Yeah, so Elmo has lots of kind of aspects to it that you could um, subscribe to. So we, our main focus is um, learning, so it's got online kind of modules, they're interactive, so you would go on, read a slide or watch a video. Um, and then you would answer questions at the end. Yeah, right. And then that was the knowledge side that was complemented with the JIB, so right. the face to face training. Yeah, right. Which is That's also, right. Yeah, recorded. So they did the knowledge side in, in their own time. Yes. But then the JIB, the delivery of JIB was scheduled on Elmo and then delivered yeah. by the team. Yeah, and then the outcome of that JIB was recorded on yeah. Elmo as well. Um, and we also use it to manage our staff's documents, so licenses and yeah, certificates yeah, yeah. and things like that, which comes in handy. Very good. All right, thanks. So Hannah, Keith Jones has asked, what were some of the biggest things that happened or surprises when COVID-19 hit? Now, just to clarify for everyone, we did the JI training in early March, which is the first thing we did. And then really COVID hit in Australia in sort of late March. Mm -hmm. So that so that everything went pear shaped in mm -hmm. late March. So what were some of the things you did at GPSO to handle that? Because you had to keep going. Mm, we did. Um, yeah, the biggest surprise is that we were able to keep going, which was great because we are an essential service. Um, the things that we did to enable us to keep going, that was the question, wasn't it? Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. Um, we separated our participants into smaller teams. Um, <coughs> Yeah, and we were really strict in maintaining that social distancing, um, especially with our more high our complex needs participants. Yeah. Yeah. And why was that? I understood it was because they um They're much more vulnerable. And they can't wear masks. They were they are able to wear masks, yeah. We did at all times. Um, but unfortunately they're not able to. So. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Very free them, yeah. So, um, and we were um, very, also very thorough in implementing our temperature checks as yeah. well, which we still continue on. And from what I recall, and also um, the hand washing JRB, which is mm -hmm. one of the early ones developed. Yeah, that was that, crucial. That was crucial, wasn't it? And that yeah, that was, showed us about. That's mm -hmm. right, that was triggered. In some respects, mm -hmm. that was triggered by COVID. Yeah. Uh, not the need to do it, but the need for it to be first. Mm. Oh, yeah. to, be, to be first and yeah, up. And no discrepancies in how to just mm. reiterate to, to all staff how to do it properly. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting, everyone's own version of how to wash your hands. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Because yeah. you might come from previous um, yeah. different sectors or whatever and you've been taught a certain way. Yeah. Mm. You know, it's old habits. Yeah, yeah. So you think you're doing it the right way until you're taught. So, so you've raised an interesting point, Brooke. Is it easier to teach people um, who have never washed their hands before how to wash their hands mm. the correct way, the GPSO way, or is it easier to teach those who have come from somewhere else and they reckon they know? No, much easier to teach someone who's never who's never been taught. Yeah. Definitely. And why is that? It's a challenge we all face, but why is it? It's, an... it, it's habit. Yeah. It's habit. It's breaking that habit of years and years of doing it a particular way. Yes. And then all of a sudden, you know, they have to totally mm. go into and a different direction. Cool. Then teachers, yeah, yeah. he's never. Exactly. Then it's right. as a clean yeah. Yeah. And why is it important to GPSO that everyone does do it the same way? Why, why is that important from a leadership perspective that everyone does it the same way, anyone? Oh, because if there's any, if there's, um, if it is done incorrectly, <coughs> You know, we could say that they have been taught the right way. Yeah. That this is this is the way we do it. This is the way we have developed mm. it, and this yeah. is the way. So there's no discrepancies. Yeah. Yeah. Suppose, yeah. And um, and if you have five different ways, then there's always going to be arguments and interpretations about whether they've done it properly. Yes. Done it correctly. Done it correctly. Right. Yeah. Good. 
So to continue on, uh, Brooke, and this leads into, so you probably gathered everyone that we first started off on job instruction, but now gonna lead into what they did next. So Silvio said, um, what, what systems do you use to motivate the employment of people? With uh, the people who work with those who have disability. So tell us about that. Um, so for me more so it would be probably working to the, um, my staff members' strengths. Yes. You know, so I know there was a really good example of that because we did the job relations training in about July mm -hmm. and then we focused on the foundations and I know you had a really good example of I did. Of that. Um, I worked with, beside someone who had previously had um, some disciplinary issues and had ongoing meetings and that person was then switched into my group. I got to know that person um, on a different, on a deeper level maybe, you know, and there were some cultural differences and uh, English was not this person's first language. <coughs> um, so I got to know them quite well and found out this person came from um, a cooking background oh, yeah. and previously owned a restaurant. Yes. Um, so I put this person... I didn't realise that. She owned yeah. a restaurant. She owned a restaurant mm -hmm. locally. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. I locally, didn't very good. I didn't yeah. know that part. Of <laughs> she did. Yeah. She's an amazing cook. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the more I spoke with her, the more confident she became and um, the closer we become and, and she would, you know, say little things to me and then I would put her in charge in the, in the kitchen and she just... Blossomed. She blossomed. She took off. Mm -hmm. She went from strength to strength. She's an amazing gardener, obviously sort of goes hand in hand with yeah, the cooking yeah. and she'll grow. Veggie garden. Yeah, and mm -hmm. grow her <coughs> spices. And this person would, you know, I would say initially was functioning at a two out of a five in, in staff performance. And then next minute this person, she's coming in on the days off, yeah, right. you know, checking in on the garden, we find a walking <laughs> past. Really? Yeah, um, yeah, 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 coming in on a Saturday, True. we done the new for the garden and yeah, yeah she just, yeah, she well. blossomed. So this is a classic case of the fourth foundation on the job relations card, which says make best use of each of the ability. Yep. And it says look for abilities not now being used. So prior to all this, she had an ability you didn't weren't aware of. No. And you weren't using it by but by building her, allowing her to do it, building her confidence. Yeah. What did that you do to your job as a matter of interest? Once she built her confidence and she was able to do all, you know, she was doing all this stuff, yeah. what, what did that do to your job? Made my job a lot easier. Yeah, it's funny that, isn't it? And made, and made her day, it made her day easier, yes. my day easier, and it, therefore the participants' day easier. Yeah, yeah. everyone was aware. Ev everyone won. Yes. Yeah. It's a really interesting one how, and we see this a lot, you always start to apply these foundations of job relation. Yeah. The job of a leader becomes easier if you legitimately do that. Yeah. And I think Tess, I remember Tess and Leighton, who we're going to mention later, she had a similar example because she had someone who was able to sing and she didn't know, mm -hmm. uh, a Thai lady who was able to sing and she didn't know. So she discovered that and she, and Tess started to get this lady to take the, um, you know, to write song, you know, help the participants in their yeah. singing and stuff. Yeah. And a similar sort of thing happened. Yeah. So it's in your in you guys' case, you have how many people do you have working there, Joe? In Leeton. No. Oh. Group or both. Oh, both. Um, Seventy, seventy-two. Yeah. Right. So I wonder how many other people are there of those seventy or seventy-two yeah. with abilities that are not being used now, oh. but may be able to elevate the yeah. participant outcomes. It's a real opportunity. It is. Well done. Um, so then that was question seven, wasn't it? Question eight. So I'm following a bit of an order here to so try and get a sequence. So, so we've started to touch on job relations. This is really for all of you. You may want to chime in. What challenges, uh, um, sorry, Amanda Kelgren has asked, what challenges did you find when implementing job relations? How receptive were the participants and how do you encourage re resistance? So what challenges were there with JR? I suppose that was... Um Realising we didn't have all the policies and procedures in place that we probably should have. Yeah. Um, so, so the growing business. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I think because we grew so rapidly. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the difficulty you had then was in step one, it says get the facts. And the first, second bullet point is find out what rules and customs apply. What you, when you had to do that, you realised there were gaps. Yeah. 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 And I suppose in the positive aspect of it, we filled those gaps. Yeah. yeah. Now implemented so many things from, from following that process. Yeah, so that was one of the big challenges I remember, that yeah. you discovered gaps. Yes. So the person was doing X, 
Yeah. But there was really nothing to say they shouldn't do X. Yeah. So even though we can say, well, common sense should have applied, they shouldn't have been doing it. You can't really do that. You had a leg to stand on. We did have a leg to stand on, yeah. So you had to create that leg. Yeah. And you brought in have you brought in another tool to do with job relations too. Do you remember what that was? Yeah, the positive discipline process. Yeah. Um so that kind of puts a positive um, approach on the the um Discipline. Yeah, disciplinary procedure. Yeah, I mean, what that does is it puts the circle around you guys as leaders say these are the boundaries. Yeah. But you're now outside the boundary, Mr. Person, Miss Person, Mr. or Miss, but it's your choice whether you come back inside. Yeah. So the positive discipline process is one where you state what the boundaries are, yeah. but you don't force the person to come back inside. Yeah. It's their choice, but they, have a, they understand the consequences. And make not, sure they have the education, the training yeah, to understand right. to get back in, how to get back into that circle. Exactly, because yeah. there's five key questions in that positive discipline process. We won't go into those now, but essentially you need to be able to, the company needs to be able to answer those to get the person, have the person equipped to come back inside. Yeah. If they then don't, that's their call. And yeah. there's consequences. Put the onus back on them. Put the onus back on them. Yeah. Well, yeah. So what else did you find? Uh, that was one of the challenges of JR. Um, did you have, there was some resistant participants? There, there really was, there was from my point of view, I guess, I guess that's something I can comment on there. From us? No, uh, there was, <laughs> not, from, not from the three in this room, but there was some resistance, yeah. that's the reality. In the reality, you know, there was 10 involved in the class, if there was 10 out of 10 that weren't resistant, that would be ridiculous, that never happened. Mm -hmm. So there was a resistance and um, at the, at, the way I handle that resistance is to apply the found the other side of the car is to apply the foundations. And when there was times when it was busy with us, you know, I would come in and was busy and I was doing my best to apply the foundations there. Um, what other challenges have you had with JR? Has there been any others or is it um, what about the time thing? Timing is always a challenge yeah. in anything, you know, especially in our in our roles. It's always so, you know, when you say you met with resistance, sometimes it is a matter of people just um, perhaps being a little bit overwhelmed, overwhelmed yeah. when yeah. learning all this new stuff. Yeah. And then, then in turn, we're teaching that, yes. you know, and some of these people have been in these roles for 20 or 30 years. Yes. And all of a sudden we're saying we're going in a whole different direction. Actually, that was a good you know? point because I remember one of the difficulties was that um, you raised a good point, is that you all came from good operational background, in other words, you were the people looking after the participants, mm -hmm. you all came from that background and were put into leadership roles. Mm -hmm. Now there was some resistance from some peers, weren't there? Because there were the peers, yes. Yes. and then some of you were chosen, you applied, and were chosen to be team leaders. Mm -hmm. There was some resistance from peers, wasn't there? Mm -hmm. And so how did you guys handle that? Both of you, probably not so much you, Joe. Did you, how did you handle that personally? Because I think it will be important to people watching because it will happen to everyone. Yeah. You'd have no warning of that question. No. I mean, no. from me. No. So I'm just, but I'm, That's I'm, not. I think to speak that from in. my perspective, you still maintain your respect towards all staff, yeah. regardless if they were a team leader or not. And you still valued their input and their. Oh, definitely. And you know, I think another example is how you touched on that staff member. Um, Good pick up, Joe. So, yeah. For, for me personally, Hannah and I have different. Um, uh, different experiences in this. Hannah's got a younger 2IC. Yeah. I have a, a more senior 2IC who had been there um, for 20 years in the role and she has been um, a pillar of strength. Yeah, so right. her and I <laughs> had previously worked together but she sort of more showed me the ropes when I started yeah, right. and then I was obviously put in a team leader position. I was very lucky yeah, right. to have a 2IC come in and, and support me at that level. Okay, good. So she has helped sort of smooth the way for me yeah. anyway. Our teams are really have been really welcoming yeah. and um, more than helpful. I haven't had much resistance at all from my team, which is surprising because there's an equal mix of young and old. Yeah. But yeah, I can say honestly, I've been really lucky in yeah. that regard. Yeah. There you have. Yeah. And one in particular, one of the very one of the young ones that you've got has quite an open mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and she's really well received by the other staff. Yeah, that, yeah. yeah, and she's got a good way. way. She conducts herself well. Yeah. she's got a good way. So yeah. she's able to support you yeah. in things like the, 
you know, when you have to do the training, yeah. you can fill the gap when you're yeah. like very, very okay. yeah. yeah, yeah, good. So Todd Edwards has said, how do you ensure culture is part of developing team leaders? So I'm going to answer that question, Todd, and, and it comes back to the definition of culture. So the way we define workplace culture is to is that workplace culture is the sum of people's habits in the way they go around their work. So if you think of uh, workplace culture as being the sum of people's habits in the way they go around their work, and that if you accept the fact that leaders have a strong influence, which they do, then what we need to do is help the leaders change their habits. And really that's what we that's what this is about. I mean, we don't expect these guys, I don't expect these guys to follow a blue card for the rest of their life or follow a yellow card for the rest of their life. What I do expect of them is they'll use the blue card and the yellow card to develop habits, a training habit and a leadership habit. So these cards don't last a lifetime, never are they intended to. What they're intended to do is to be structural, a way of structural practice such that people like we've got here, Brooke, Hannah and Joe, can start to develop good leadership habits. So in terms of changing the culture, how do we do that? We give them patterns that they can practice and job instruction and job relations are a really good example of that. So I hope Todd that's covered what you were um, wondering. And um, just, I'll go straight on there. Ricky Martin has said, which, and Hannah doesn't think that's a real person, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> she said that before. Hey, Ricky. <laughs> <laughs> so if it is the real one, nice to talk to you. Um, so you said which attribute of a true leader needs the most cultivation? That will always depend, but in my experience, it's always been the skill of uh, frontline leadership because you're taking people like Brooke and Hannah who have a lot of practical experience and, and uh, then you're asking them to get their results through others. So rather than do the looking after and the care of the participants themselves, they now have to have that same amount of care delivered through other people. So what's in their hearts, and I know their hearts are very strong in this area, they've got to transfer what's in their hearts across to others because they can't do it themselves or they'll go mad. Mm. So the challenge is to lead others using the attributes of JR to uh, develop that same level of um, care in other people. Would that be a fair comment? Not yeah, easy. Yeah, it's, it's not, not easy. easy. It's not easy to let go. No, no, that's that's right. Right. Still yeah. learning in that. Run. And we always will. We always yeah, will. Yeah. But it's a, what you said, Brooke, is key. It isn't easy to let go no. for a leader. Um, but one way of letting go is to find the time to practice some of these these patterns, like we have here. These two patterns there, and there are others. They're not these. Are not the only two. So hopefully, Ricky, that's answered your question to some degree. So this is to any of you. David Hutchison has said, how do you measure the risk to one's general well-being? What we mean by that is you guys as leaders, how do you measure how you're going as leaders? Well, Joe, in your role as an HR policy officer, how do, you, how do you measure how you're feeling and how you're going during the day? Any of the three of you? Um, stress levels are pretty high. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if there is a bit of a danger, we do tend to neglect ourselves a little bit. Um, agree. Yeah. yeah agree. <laughs> so what can you, what, what's, yeah. when that happens, and I think that happens in all organisations, what's, what, what would you be seeking from the organisation? And I don't want you to overcommit to that, but broadly speaking, what would you be seeking from the organisation? What do you need to be able to do these things correctly? Correct tools. Correct tools. The correct tools. The yep. correct timing. Like timing. The adequate timing. The adequate timing. Adequate timing. So the time for training, the time for doing. It's not just the time for training, is it? No. I noticed that's one of the things that we probably got a bit caught out on. Yeah. Um, is we had we allocated the time for training, and that was fine. Mm -hmm. But and we talked about allocating the time for practice, mm -hmm. and we did a, a sort of a good job on it. Yeah. But I think we could have done a better job on allocating the time for practice. Yeah. Um, and being more strict on that. We probably do need a little bit more administration time. Yeah. I think that might definitely that help relieve some of the pressure that we have. Oh, our jobs are predominantly, especially Hannah and I, um, you know, it would be 80% on the floor, mm -hmm. which is, which is um, really good, but you talk, you touched briefly before about <coughs> letting go. Yeah. That's, that's a hard thing too because if we're out of the room, we're out of um, 
in meetings or whatever, still we have to be aware of what's happening on the floor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's very hard. You can't just sort of go, okay, bang, done for the day and I'm in an office because it, it just doesn't work like that. Yeah. You know. And you would have a view of that, Joe, because you're a little bit to the side. Um, how what what's a, what's some of the things that management can do, do you think, to uh, help these guys and um, I think um, offer you guys adequate support as well. So um, have that point of contact for you guys to go if you need assistance with dealing with the staff. Well, yeah, sometimes they need advice. They can't do it all on their own. They yeah, just need someone right. to bounce this stuff off. Yeah, someone to bounce things off as well as yeah, adequate um, admin time to. Um, I think you mentioned previously how um, some weeks are full on, some weeks are manual, yeah. and just finding a balance between that. Mm. Is, you know, all weeks aren't the same, no days yeah. are the same no. in this industry. I mean, yeah. You've got a lot of variation. Yeah, yes. a lot of variation. And I think processing lines, so not everything is done sort of time. Yeah. You know, so things pop up all the yeah. time. Yeah. yeah. Very good. Um, so, Kathy, you asked, how do you decide on the depth and breadth of concepts and methods to introduce the term leaders? That's basically, I'll answer that, that's a pool system. And what I mean by that is, it, dep it just depends. Um, if there's an, if they're having issues with, uh, no, I guess I'll go back a bit. Staff, if staff aren't doing things, there's either two reasons. One is they don't know, can't do. If, so, if a staff member doesn't know, can't do, then you train them. Yeah. So they need to be found time for this. If the genuine reason for things are not happening is don't know, can't do, then it's a training issue. But if it's a do know, can do, but choosing not to, you can train them to be blue in the face and nothing will happen. Mm -hmm. So if it's a do know, can do, but then for some reason not doing what they're supposed to do, then it's a JR issue. So really um, a JR skill issue. So really what you've got to do there is go back and find out the root cause of why people aren't doing things. And it's usually for one of those two reasons. Don't know, can't do, or they do know and can do, but they're choosing not to. Now, this is the one that's the most common, although people jump to this, oh, we've got to retrain people. I think we've had discussions about this. You've got to be careful with, oh, we'll just retrain them because that's not, you're going to retrain people to the glue in the face. Mm -hmm. if, they're, if they know and they can, but they're choosing not to, retraining is not going to help. Mm -hmm. It's a leadership issue. It's a leadership opportunity, mm -hmm. and we have to practice the skills of your relations. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that's answered that question there, Kati. 13, as a hammer. Just talk a little bit about these are uh, Dan Conrad has asked about geographically dispersed teams. Mm -hmm. So we we weren't that far dispersed, but yeah. we did have an issue with with um, so GPSO is at Griffith yeah. and the Leeton, which is about 45 minutes away. Mm -hmm. to ha and we had Tess over there as a team leader. Mm -hmm. So how did we handle that? How did do you remember what we did? Yeah, we um we FaceTimed and Zoomed Tess. Um and yeah, we to make it um easier for her to still tune in and then we would also plan our meetings on a Tuesday when when she could come a bit more easier. Yeah the training the mentoring. Yeah. And with the um with the zooming and FaceTime, mm -hmm. you uh, you guys probably remember that happened during JI and I was asking you to try for say Hannah you to train someone and video that and send me the video with the job instruction breakdown. That's right. And then yeah. we called in afterwards. I we can't just about that. <laughs> <laughs> we love doing that. Oh, we love that. You love that. <laughs> so that's one of the things we did, wasn't it? Yeah. You actually, I, I wasn't there, I but you that. filmed it. Yeah. And then you would call in. Yeah. And we'd have a discussion about the way you delivered and what went well and what didn't and move on and what are we going to practice next. Yeah. So, um, so Dan, that's how we covered the geographical disbursement that we had in this case, which wasn't that far, but really distance is irrelevant. The fact is, during COVID, Tess couldn't come over and we couldn't go there. Mm. So. All right. So then I think, uh, I think, um, Cindy, you talked about the curiosity and the path we took. I think we've probably made that fairly clear that we started off with uh, job instruction, these guys. And then we went to job, then we moved on to job relations. The reason for job instruction first was because to control was um, the that first module, which was medic medic. Oh, um medicine. No, no, the first module was medication, not medication, what infection, infection, infection control. control. Yeah. And the reason that was done first was because that was the biggest risk. Yeah. And that tied in with COVID. Yeah. So that's why we started with job instruction. Then we went to job relations. 
And then we, the last thing we did was lead a standard work, which is something we're not going to cover here. But that's horses for courses. We wouldn't necessarily have done it that way if the circumstances were different. All right, so we're near the end of our time. Um, I didn't tell you, you guys don't know that this question was coming. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> but if we could have our time again, so if we could wind the clock back to February last year, would we would would you want me to do the follow the same path, or would we follow a different path? What would we do differently? And I don't mind what your answer is, honestly. I haven't told you the question's coming. So would we follow a similar path, or do you think what might we do differently? I think we did it the way that we had to at the time, but if we had our time again, I would have preferred to do like perhaps the leader standard work and then yeah, right, yeah, follow along. Okay, as I think it was intended. Okay. Yeah. I suppose that, so you knew how to manage staff resistance. Do the job relations. Do the job relations. Do the job relations first. Yeah. It's, a, yeah. it's an interesting yeah. one, isn't it? Because yeah. is that's probably the one that's caused, that's um, exactly. you had the most opportunity. Yeah, I was quite mm -hmm. unnerved and so a little bit floundering at the time. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, good. Thanks for your honesty. That's okay. Um, I I was the second lot that did it, Oscar. So we actually oh did yeah, you did too. We actually did do it in that order. You did, you did right. So um, yeah, yeah. So there was three of you, Hannah and two others. Tess and, and Catherine. Yeah, Hannah, Tess and Catherine, who mm -hmm. did JI first. I forgot about that. Yeah. Did JI first, but you guys did JR then JI which in the was, second group, which was good for us because yeah, we right. had seen initially yeah. the resistance for the first three. Uh, um, you know, and I think. Uh, they started in December, we started in March. March yeah. Right. So there's a few months okay. um, different. So we were able to obviously see what happened and then when you sort of teach us this stuff, okay. we were able to implement that straight yeah. away. Okay. Brilliant. Yeah. That makes sense. I've forgotten that. Thank yeah. you. Joe, what about you? What would we do differently? Anything? Um, I, don't, I agree with Hannah's mm -hmm. comment, to be honest. Yeah. I think just seeing the cha the resistance <coughs> change in the workplace and mm -hmm. um there's so many new things being implemented at once, specifically with the team leader yeah, role yeah. being, mm -hmm. um, yeah, new, implemented. New. Yeah, as well as training and how we manage um, performance. There's yeah. lots of change. So I think um, JR first would yeah. give you guys a bit more mm -hmm. direction, direction on how to handle that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Now I know you three were really nervous about this, and I know <laughs> you were guys. particular. I know you were Hannah particular. Yes, so all three of you did a fantastic job. Um, even I've got that theatrical background. <laughs> no, all three of you did a fantastic job, and I know it's taken an hour out of your day and a bit of preparation, a bit of awareness of the questions beforehand. So I do really appreciate it, all three of you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ross. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.